Doesn't every generation complain about the next one that's coming along? Is what we're seeing at the moment not just more old hats that's occurred for every generation previously? Um, well, yes and no. Yes, every generation complains, and the complaints tend to be similar. And that's gone on not since the dawn of history. People always quote, you know, Socrates or something. But really, that begins when you start getting modernity. You start getting each generation is changing, you know, around the 16th, 17th century in, in Europe. So yes, that's been going on a long time. But it's never before been the case that the mental health of the young generation suddenly was really different and really bad. So, you know, the main argument I get against me is just the one you just said that, oh, this is just another moral panic. There's nothing going on here. This is what always happens. No, this is not what always happens. You don't ever before get a doubling of the suicide rate of preteen girls. You don't ever get an across the board, across many nations, plummeting of mental health all beginning right around 2012, 2013. So no, this time is really different. What is it that children need to do in childhood? Like, we don't think about it that importantly. It's just it, it's just the thing that you do before you get to puberty, where right. you start to right. become a person. But yeah. those experiences are very formative. W what does a good childhood look like? Yeah. Now, thanks for setting it up that way, because there's so much focus on the phones and social media. And and I was focused on that too. But what I decided to do in writing this book and writing The Anxious Generation was I'm not even going to talk about the phones and social media until I've taken readers through what is childhood? Why do we have it? How is human childhood different from every other animal, including chimpanzees? And so, you know, if you start just with mammals, all mammals have the same life plan, which is huge investment from the parents or the mother. In the, in the baby, long childhood, big brain. How do you wire up the brain? Play. Play is the thing. Your brain doesn't grow from nursing. Your brain grows from moving away from your mother, trying to climb something. Uh, you know, anyone who's had a, a puppy or a kitten knows they want to play all the time because they have to practice the skills to wire up the brain. So we have to let our kids wire up their brains. Now, humans are different because we have much bigger brains and we have culture. This is crucial. Other animals, they grow as you know, sort of fast as they can, and then they reproduce. Humans, we grow fast, and then we slow down. Right? At age 7 to thir 12, 13, we're not growing very fast. And it's thought that that period is a critical period for cultural learning. Um, all the way through puberty, we're really trying to soak in, how do we do things around here? Um, what do adults do? How do I approach the opposite sex or sexuality? So there's a lot of learning that has to happen. And the problem is, We've taken that learning period. We've said, instead of learning from grownups around you or even from you know older kids in your neighborhood, how about if we just hook you up? Here's a phone or an iPad. We'll just hook you up and you can get socialized by random weirdos on the internet who are selected by an algorithm for being really extreme. How about that? Well, that's kind of what we've done. Yeah. I, uh, I'm around kids more and more as my friends... Um, finally become less man children and actually become fathers themselves of, of actual children. And it's so interesting. Like my, my group of friends largely are pretty red pilled on this, the, the concerns about exposure to technology. But, you know, when you go for dinner at the sort of times that you do with guys that have got families, you end up going a little bit early, which means you're also around other families. And we go to these restaurants and I'll get to see, yeah. you know, how other families that probably just aren't aware of this uh, are anesthetizing a boisterous child and a lot of the time at the table you know it's the kid starts to act up they're a little bit bored and the parents are trying to have a conversation or the adults at the table are trying to have a conversation and one of them just goes ah, 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 you know open up the yeah. phone pass yeah. the phone and the the maddest thing that i've seen from sort of two to three-year-old children is their ability to skip ads on youtube like they understand the difference between uh, an advert Right. and the button right. and how they yeah. can get past it and i'm like well first off look if you're giving your kid this to anesthetize them buy youtube premium it's 10 10 bucks a month <laughs> and it's it'll change your life gets rid of the um, ads yeah um but also the this level of engagement with you know the capitalist system of, yeah. of, of, of facebook pixel tagging and and all that mm -hmm. stuff from two years old is crazy yeah. 
No, that's right. That's right. You know, we're very protective of our kids. And you know, if I said to people, how about how about if we have this thing that w- w- we have a special door, a special window, and we're going to put it on your child's crib, and advertisers and corporations can come and they can just communicate with your kid, and you have nothing to do with it. What do you What do you think? Is that okay? Like, no, we would never let that happen. And then, suppose when your daughter is eleven, twelve, thirteen, we'll put a special window on her bedroom, and strange men can come and they can talk to her through the window. And they can look at her through the window. How about that? Would you do that? Like, no, of course you wouldn't do that. But that's kind of what we're doing. You know, we're, we're, we're saying here, companies can have access to our kids and they can train them with the stimulus response paradigm. And strangers can have access to our children uh, once they get a social media account. And they can try to convince them to meet up in the real world. They can try to sell them things, all kinds of stuff like that. Actually, I'm going to pick up, you use the word anesthetize, which is a very good word here, because you know, as many people know, like 100, 150 years ago, there were a variety of medications for children like that had opiates in them to calm the child and help them sleep. Uh, or we'd give them alcohol. Uh, we didn't know that these things interfered with, with their development. And we all discovered as soon as we got our first iPhone, I mean, I have video, you know, like uh, my, my son was born in 2006. And so many of our videos of me videotaping him end with him reaching for the phone and saying, iPhone, iPhone, like he, he, you know, he wants it, he needs it, because it's so stimulating. Back then, in the early days of all this stuff, you know, 2008 to 2012, we thought the technology was magical. And we thought, you know, yeah, let's let our kids get stimulated by like stimulation, isn't that going to be good for their brain development? Like, so yeah, it, it, it seemed okay to do it. It'll give him a head start. He'll be you know, digital natives will be comfortable with this technology. And besides, everyone else is doing it, so it must be okay. So yeah, we ended up anesthetizing them. Let's back out of the technology thing. We're going to get onto that. But let's just talk about like, what has changed with regards to parenting styles outside of technology mm-hmm. over the last few decades. How, how has this created okay. the, the raw material yeah. foundation for the kids that would grow up? No, that's a great question. It's one that I don't write enough about because I am focused on the technology. But Greg and I did write about this in The Coddling of the American Mind, that um, there is a long-term transition over generations as when life is hard and families are big um, and religion is an important part of life, you tend to have a very structured, you know, kids are growing up with a lot of structure. There are do's and don'ts. There are punishments if you misbehave. Um, and th- there's a big liberal conservative split on this. In general, conservatives want more strict child rearing. Progressives want more lenient, liberal, and now called gentle parenting. And in general, as, as our societies have gotten wealthier and safer and our families get smaller, we've all kind of moved over to the gentle side. Uh, you know, when I was a kid, spanking was normal, but it was like only for the very, like my, my sisters and I, we got spanked like a few times when we did something really terrible. Uh, but now it's, you know, at least in you know educated circles, like that's almost unheard of. Whereas a couple of generations before, there would have been a lot more physical. Your school punishment. teacher would have. Yes, that's right. Schools would, would hit the kids. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, so in many ways it's progress. On the other hand, if you take out, if you take out the threats, the punishments, all the negative stuff, and you kind of leave it with like what you see a lot of parents doing, like, now, Johnny, was that a wise choice or an unwise choice? As opposed to saying, no, you do not hit your sister. Yeah. Um, so I think we've become a little too gentle, too unstructured. And this might also help explain a really interesting twist in the data that it's not really in the book. I found a lot of it even afterwards. Um, is that the mental health crisis is much worse for children in families on the left than on the right. Um, so liberals or progressives have always had slightly higher levels of neuroticism, anxiety, depression, just a little bit more than conservatives. It's a big, you know, long studied thing. Conservatives are a little bit happier than liberals, adults and children. And if you plot out the levels of, you know, of happiness or the negative stuff like meaninglessness, on all the graphs in my book, you'll see like you get a straight line until around 2011, 2012. And then all of a sudden, the lines go up like a hockey stick. Well, if you break it out by uh, are you a liberal or conservative, which is asked on one or two surveys, um, it's the liberal kids, especially the liberal girls, they go up first and fastest. 
something happened, whatever it was that changed in the early 2010s, it hit liberal kids, especially liberal girls, the hardest. And I think part of it is what we're talking about. If you are rooted deeply in structure and community and you have to go to church every Sunday, or you know, you're an Orthodox Jewish kid and you've got Shabbat, you've got you know, 24 hours where there are no devices and you're with your family, moving to the digital technology didn't wash these kids out to sea. But if you're a more progressive family, usually a smaller family, uh, more econ- more mobile, you move around more perhaps, um, you have weaker ties, a lot of freedom, a lot of creativity, but those kids uh, seem to be especially vulnerable to being washed away in the early 2010s. It's not just left, right. It's also religious conservative, uh, religious or secular. So, so secular religious, I'm sorry, uh, secular conservative kids show the least increase. Everybody goes up, but they show the least increase. Whereas uh, progressive non-religious kids or families, that's where you see the biggest increase in mental health problems. I wonder how much of it from the liberal progressive side comes from this very softly, softly, gentle approach to discipline and parenting. Because, you know, I, I, I hesitate dropping into bro psychology this early in a podcast, but fuck it. Like, if you think about your level of discomfort exposure, what you're, what you're comfortable being uncomfortable with, how often has someone told you no? How often have you been told that you're in the wrong? How often has someone raised their voice at you? How often has someone been stern? You know, all of these opportunities are, are times where you learn, okay, I can self-regulate. This, is, yep, this can exactly. happen to me and I'm still safe. Yeah. This can happen That's to right. me and I'm still loved. No one's going to abandon me. I, this isn't mm-hmm. a comment on my moral character or my worth as a human. This is an inbuilt part of being a fallible, flawed human that makes errors. And mom and dad are going to say, you don't hit your sister. You don't do that. Go, you're on timeout. Go sit on the step and sit on the step mm-hmm. until you've calmed yourself down. And if you've never experienced that and you continue, it, like, you don't even need, you don't need to know anything about human psychology yep, to know that if right. you train a system on a type of stimulus, it will become hypersensitized when you get outside the bounds of that stimulus. Yeah. And that's where that's we are. That's right. No, I think that's perfect. Um, I can just add a little psychological color to it in two ways. Uh, one is to bring in the concept of anti-fragility, which I hope many of your listeners are already familiar with. Um, you know, some things are fragile, a glass is fragile, you don't let kids play with it, it'll break. So we give them plastic, which is resilient. Uh, if a kid drops it, it won't break, but it doesn't get better. Uh, but some things are anti-fragile. Um, they need to be stressed and strained and dropped and 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 uh, suffer setbacks in order to get strong. Uh, and this comes from this, my NYU colleague, Nassim Taleb. So bones and muscle are anti-fragile. If you raised your kids by saying, I never want you to put stress on your bones, you know, never go downstairs, take the elevator, you know, their bones are going to get weak. Same thing with muscle. The immune system is anti-fragile and kids are anti-fragile. So that's, uh, that's like the psychology underneath a lot of what you were just saying. But then there's another one, which I haven't really talked about publicly because it sort of can easily get taken out of context. Maybe that'll happen here when I- Never. We have the most unreasonably reasonable audience on the internet. (laughs) You'll be fine. Okay. It's really important for kids to learn how to accept injustice. Now, let me quickly keep talking so that that doesn't just get taken (laughs) out of context. Um, You know, oh, you know, John Haidt, you know, white guy says that people need to just suck it up and accept injustice. No, but but the, the situation that you just talked about, you know, like, you know, no, you do not hit your sister, time out. And it might be the case that your sister hit you first. Mm -hmm. And maybe there's more to the story. And so maybe your parents are actually treating you unfairly. And in general, we would say, you know, authoritative parents would always hear them out. Like, why did you hit your sister? Tell me why. You know, if you can't justify it, we'll punish you. But sometimes, sometimes things are unfair. And if you're a child who is raised where in general, your parents, you know, you trust them in general, they're fair, but sometimes they're not. Sometimes they're just not. And you just learn like, okay, you know, it happens. I'm a little mad and I'll get over it. Okay, now fast forward 15, 20 years. Imagine you're an employer hiring two recent college grads. One of them has never had to face injustice. One of them, everything was always fair. And if they thought it wasn't fair, they could say, I think that's unfair. And then they could work it out. Another kid had authoritative parents who sometimes made mistakes and sometimes was treated unfairly. Who would you rather hire? And I think what we're seeing in universities is that there's a certain kind of activist young person who 
who sees flaws in the world and thinks that they see everything as it is, and they should never have to accept any unfairness. And they can just become very, very difficult to, to work with because they're used to getting their way. So yeah, we're doing kids no favors with this sort of, you know, gentle, you shouldn't have to do anything that doesn't make you comfortable. Like, no, sometimes in life, you do have to do things that make you uncomfortable or that, you know, or that you think you have to respond to situations that you think are unfair. I spent a lot of time running a big events company in the UK. So I ran nightclubs for, for a decade and a half. And mm -hmm. one of the things Fine. that I very quickly uh, realized stepping into that industry is it's full of scumbags. I uh -huh. was trained in the art of scumbaggery. But, uh, you know, if I'd gone into that, I, I had this really interesting experience because I was at university, right? So I was seeing and I was doing two business degrees, did a master's in uh, and a bachelor's in business stuff. But I was running a business. And from doing nightlife, you get to see HR, marketing, B2B, B2C, hiring, firing, every, you see the mm -hmm. full works, right? It's a full gamut of everything. So I was getting to learn about business 101, but I was also experiencing business. And what I was being taught and what I was experiencing were diverging very quickly. But the interesting point here is, up until you leave university, most people can campaign their way out of situations that they don't want to be in. This is wrong. The uh, standards that this professor is holding me to are too high. You know, we've seen this happen a good yep. bunch, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? People being... When you enter the world of business, someone doesn't need to play by your rules. They can, they can bring you up to the brink of signing a contract. You're balls deep in lawyer fees. Everything's ready to go. You bet the business on it. And they can go, uh, by the way, this is, it's called crank on confirmation is, is the, the actual tactic. And they just crank the fuck out of you. And they go, hey, um, yeah, we're going to pay 20%. And I saw this deal's dead in the water. And you go, no. You, wow. You can't wow. do it it's like because blackmail. I've got, I, I'm, I'm, and they, yeah, we know that yeah. you're this deep in it, which is why we want to pay 20% less. Like that's oh just the God. way that business works. Like wow. this is what crank on confirmation is. And it happens in nightlife over and over and over and over again. Ugh. My point being, if you, like, if you're unable to deal with someone coming and twisting you, or you're going, all right, yeah. well, I know that you need me let's let's play a game of chicken here with who needs right. who the most you're just going to be so dysregulated that you can't deal with anything my point being this sort of hyper i think of it like an overton window of sensitivity you know you have the entire gamut of human experience and then you have mm -hmm. this range within which you're uh, familiar the tighter that you make that any small movement outside of that is going to feel like like mm -hmm. dysregulation and i suppose as well this gets into something I've spoken about with Dr. Anna Machin and, and, and tons of people to do with child rearing, the importance of risky play and why yes. that's so important. Yes, that is such a key word. And that this is something I think that won't be as familiar to, uh, to listeners. Um, you know, even listeners who might've read The Coddling of the American Mind or might know about the importance of play. There's really interesting research. There's a, uh, a play researcher from Norway named Ellen Sandsater and she has a couple of papers from 2010 and more recently on the need for risk, specifically risk and thrill. And the key word that I really resonate with is thrill. So, you know, we know that even if you know kids need to play, but we don't want them to play in any place dangerous. We don't want them to climb any trees. As far as I can tell, um, New Zealand is the only English speaking country left in the world where children are allowed to climb trees. You know, like I remember, you know, at recess when I was a kid, if there's a tree, you know, sometimes we climb a tree. Um, but we, we sort of decided we have to keep kids safe from danger. So nothing that could have any real danger. But what San Cedar points out is why are kids seeking out danger? Why is this almost a universal feature? Why are kids doing things that they're almost certainly going to make them get hurt? You know, why are boys doing jumps on their bicycle? They know they're going to get hurt. Why are kids skateboarding down steep hills? They know they're going to fall at some point. And the reason she says is because part of our evolutionary programming is to test our abilities, learn to manage risks that are small risks, uh, because life is full of risk. Once you're not protected by your parents, boy, is life dangerous out in the jungle, out in the wild, out in the world of nightclubs. Um, so we have to, part of our, our mandate as a child is try things that are a little bit dangerous and you get to select how dangerous it is. And so, you know, when I would take my kids to Coney Island here in New York city, in a big you know, amusement park area, um, 
there, the kids like in the car, there'd be so much discussion of like, are, are you going to do the thunderbolt today or the, you know, the slingshot? Like, oh no, that's no, that's too scary for me. You know, everyone, they're all trying to adjust, but then once they do it, they come off. I mean, they are jumping. They are exhilarated. The thrill is what they've been craving. And what Sam Cedar says is it's that process of being afraid, being really afraid, like the roller coaster, it's about to go over the top and it's about like, you're really afraid. And then on the way down, you're screaming and it's thrilling and pleasurable and fearful. And then when you get to the bottom and you make it off the other end, it's just thrilling. And when you do that, you're actually changing your brain. You do that over and over again and you develop the brain of a person who can face down some scumbag or some person threatening them, who can actually deal with threats and stand their ground and think quickly and not just panic and melt down. So our kids need risk and thrill. That means they're gonna get hurt. They're gonna sometimes break bones, um, but the alternative is to keep them soft so that they're gonna break their minds. What, it, this obviously rolls from um, infancy, parents into preschool, school, secondary school, What's happening to children when they get into school and they are first faced with test scores and assessment and and structure? You have to you get to school at this time, and no, you can't do that. And the teacher, like, how much of this is laid at the feet of parents, and how much of this is laid at the feet of the education system? Yeah, it's a kind of a yeah, it is a mix. Um, the sort of the normal human progression is up until age six, seven, maybe even eight, um, there's really no value at all to homework or having too much structure. You know, by eight, nine, ten, you know, they 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 can really learn, um, you know, to to fit in, to conform. But the early grade, especially kindergarten and first grade here in the U.S., um, there's really very little evidence that they benefit from being pushed to read faster or to learn math faster. We have this naive idea that if they start learning multiplication in kindergarten, they will end up in high school further ahead. It's kind of a naive notion of, we'll give them a head start and they'll end up further ahead, but that's not true. In Scandinavia, especially Finland, where they don't really start kids until age seven, they don't really do any academic stuff until age seven, and their kids are among the best in the world in all these academic measures. So, um, so I guess I would say, at a certain point, yeah, they do need to learn all that stuff. Uh, they do need to be self-regulating. And if they're going to fit into a free market capitalist economy and be functioning people and be prosperous, they need self they need all those skills. But that doesn't mean you have to really start them very strictly early on. What kids need in kindergarten and first grade is especially a lot more play than we give them. Uh, we need to really back off on the homework and the heavy academics uh, in kindergarten and first grade, is my opinion. What's happening to test scores with regards to students? So uh, there are two, there's a global measure of test scores around the world. That's PISA, the Program for International Something Assessment, um, Scholastic, I suppose. And uh, with PISA, what we see is that scores were going up from the 90s. I think it started in the 90s. Scores were sort of going slowly up uh, from the 90s to the 2012 assessments every three years. And beginning at the 2012 assessment, some of them start to go down. And then they go down further in the most recent. And everybody points to that and says, oh, COVID, wow, COVID was so terrible. And it was. It was terrible that we took kids out of school. It was terrible that we took kids who weren't in any danger and said, you don't get to go to school uh, because what if you bring home the virus to an adult? Um, and so it's true that COVID, you know, being out of school did hurt test scores. But what people are only just beginning to realize, when you look at those graphs, it didn't start with COVID. It started when kids and everybody got on phones around 2012. In America, we have the NEEP, N-A-E-P, National Assessment of Educational Progress. It's called the Nation's Report Card. Same thing. There we have data back from the 70s. So we were making progress. Like kids literally, you know, in fourth or eighth grade, whenever they measure it, kids literally were learning more about math, science, and, and better at, and reading. There was progress for decades, slow but steady progress until 2012. And then it begins to reverse. And yes, it reverses even more during COVID, but the reversal started around 2012. So um, I think the main thing we should be focusing on here is phones in schools. Um, we'll, you know, we'll talk more about what phones are doing to all of us, but 
the idea that a child has access, you know, like a seventh, uh, you know, seventh grader has a smartphone in their pocket, they're going to text. If any, if the phone is available, someone is texting. And if someone is texting or group texting or posting on, on, on Instagram, then everyone has to be checking. Otherwise at lunch, they're going to be the one who doesn't know the thing that happened during third period. So once kids, uh, around 2012 is when we get the phone-based childhood. That's r- r- that's roughly when teens switch from flip phones to smartphones right around then. As soon as that happens, they're not paying as much attention in school. They're not learning enough. They're not learning as much as they did. They're not paying as much attention to each other, and they start getting lonelier. So after 2012, our kids are getting stupider and lonelier. And I think a lot of it, not all, but a lot of it is because of the phone. What was that article that you tweeted about Gen Z reading books for pleasure or them not doing it? Yes. So Jean Twenge, uh, who's been fantastic, she was one of the first to really call attention to this in 2017, that something big is happening to our kids. And Jean is a master of these four giant data sets that we have in America, long running surveys, uh, monitoring the future goes back to the 1970s. Every year they they interview large samples of 12th graders, 10th graders, and 8th graders. Um, and so we have decades of data. And one of the questions, they, they ask a lot of questions. One of them is, uh, you know, have you, uh, how often do you read books for pleasure? Or have you read a book for pleasure in the last month? I can't remember the exact timing. And what, what Jean shows is that the number who have read no books, I think that's how it is. Like, how, you know, how many of you read, you know, zero in the last year for pleasure or, you know, one to three or five to 10, the number who have read zero books in the last year, uh, has been going up for a while. It didn't start in 2012. Um, as kids are watching more television, cable TV, going on the internet, book reading has been declining, being replaced by, uh, by other screens. That's been going on for a long time, but it accelerates after 2012. Because again, once you have a smartphone and you have social media, which is going to suck up all of your time, it, there is no limit to how much you need to consume or post or monitor. So um, life on a smartphone, what I'm calling the phone-based childhood, takes up so much time. There is no time for hobbies or reading or anything. And so Gene shows these dramatic graphs of, you know, the number who never read a book, those go up and the number of books people read on average goes down. We have a nation of young people who have read very, very few books. Is there anything else that we need to say about the education system and what it's got wrong, maybe from a disciplinarian standpoint? Mm -hmm. We know about this sort of um, early thrusting of academic achievement onto kids in the hopes that it kind of starting earlier pushes them out ahead more late. Yeah. Is there anything else aside from the technology that the education oh, system's sure. got wrong? Oh my goodness, yes. So um, one of the, you know, in this book, I'm trying to be totally not political and and just really just focus on the kids. But since I'm talking with you, Chris, I'll, I'll share some other thoughts related to other parts here. of We're all bigots here. It's fine, Jonathan. Yeah. <laughs> um, so education schools have been accused of being ideologically progressive since the 1930s. Uh, and they are, they lean left. Um, the military leans right, the police lean right, the arts lean left, education, education schools lean left. That's just the way it is. That's not necessarily a problem. But what I've been focused on since 2011 as a social scientist is the loss of viewpoint diversity. When everyone trying to figure something out, if everyone's on the left or the right, you don't get conf- you, you don't get your confirmation biases challenged, and you start getting what I've called you start getting structural stupidity. That is, you know, someone can say something really stupid, and and no one dares to challenge them because if you challenge them, you look like you're a conservative or you know or a sexist or a racist or something. You'll be accused of something. So people just keep their mouth shut. I get emails from students in uh, grad programs in education periodically, and they say basically, "Help! I came here to learn how to teach." All we learn how to do is racial justice and equity. Like we never learn, you know, everything is oppression, everything's racism. We don't learn how to teach. So I can't say this is true for all ed schools, but for the elite schools, I think they are largely, they've become very, very ideological. They were that before 2015. But in the kind of the great awakening that we've had in the real intensification of of sort of the left-right culture war, uh, you know, we can see the right going off the deep end in a lot of ways. But, you know, if we're talking about schools, it's really, it's, you know, the left and the education schools. 
So I think that um, there's always been a debate between sort of progressive educational ideals and conservative. And I've always seen that as a yin yang sort of thing. Like you actually need the tension of them pushing. But since there are very few conservatives left in higher education, um, you know, in the social sciences and in, edu- and in education schools, it's all now very, very ideologically progressive. And that means you have a lot more the gentle parenting, the focus on equality of outcomes by race, um, regardless of inputs, let's get rid of tests, let's get rid of honors classes. Uh, so I think education schools have been working very, very hard to lose the trust of centrists, Republicans, uh, and anyone who actually cares that their kids get an education. Um, so again, uh, you know, in the current book on mental health, I, I'm not, I don't want to get get into it. But if we're talking about what's happening to our kids' schools and education, I think I think the educational establishment is becoming structurally stupid. Um, and we saw clear evidence of this in San Francisco during COVID, where the school board was, you know, they were totally focused on pulling down statues of Abe Lincoln and renaming schools, um, you know, um, and the the citizens of San Francisco who are, you know, very far left were so fed up with it, they voted out the school board. Um, so yeah, I think the education system is, is becoming, in this country, very, very ideological. Talk to me about the newest data that you found around smartphones. You know, you've been circling this wagon for quite a while. And yeah, spent yeah. a good bit of time on this book since your last one, which was mm-hmm. something not too dissimilar. What yeah. What are the primary harms of technology on kids, and and what's the mm-hmm. latest data about that? Sure. So there's been a, you know a lot. There's a huge academic literature on whether we all agree that there's a correlation. We all agree. It turns out even there's a few major sort of skeptics and critics, and then there's Gene Twenge and me on the other side, and that's sort of the where a lot of the debate has been. And it turns out we actually agree on the size of the correlation between how much time you spend on social media and how anxious and depressed you are. When you say we so, agree, do you mean you and Gene or you and the other no, side? No, me and the other side. They've done a number of meta-analyses and they say, you know, the correlation is around 0.1 to 0.15. Uh, but that's for boys and girls together. Whereas Gene and I and many others have found the correlation is much bigger for girls. It, social media harms girls much more than boys. So uh, Gene and I found that the correlation for girls is about 0.2. Well, that's actually pretty much the same. If they say it's 0.1 to 0.15 correlation for everyone, that means they're basically saying the correlation is around 0.15, maybe even higher for girls. So we actually agree. And that that correlation is actually pretty big in public health effect. It's not big in a mathematical sense of variance explained, but it's about the same size as you get from many other public health things you know, calcium consumption and later osteoporosis. I mean, all sorts of effects are around that size. So we actually agree on that. But then the debate, uh, they say it's small. We say it's actually as big as everything else. Um, uh, The big debate is, okay, there's a correlation, but correlation doesn't show causation. You know, we have to prove causation. And so I've been uh, collecting. I I started this uh, in 2019 after I I was challenged uh, on the coddling the American mind. Um, I said, well, let's get to the bottom of this. Is there a mental health crisis? Because back then, the critics were saying, there isn't even a mental health crisis. It's just, you know, self-report stuff. It's, it's It's an illusion. Well, now it's clear, no, it was not an illusion. The rates have been going up since 2012. Um, now the question is, what caused it? And I've been collecting experiments with these big Google Docs. If you go to jonathanheight.com slash reviews, you can find all of our Google Docs created with Zach Rausch. Uh, And we have one that lists all the studies we can find that are correlational studies, the longitudinal studies, the experimental studies. Sorry, and this is like getting too geeky and all, but the point is there's like, we have about 20, 25 true experiments that we found. And uh, And the large majority of them do show causal effects. And the ones that don't show causal effects is very interesting. If you look at the six or seven that fail to find an effect of like taking kids off phones, they all use a very short time period. So if your experiment is, we're going to make kids st- or college students stay off of social media for a week, you know, or three days, and then we're going to see how they're doing. And guess what? You take somebody who's heavily addicted, you take away their drug, and you check in on them a day later or a week later. How are they doing? Not well. But the studies that waited a month almost all find they're doing a lot better. They're much happier. So, you know, I don't know what else we can do here. Like, we've got the correlational evidence. We've got the experimental evidence. The experimental evidence shows a clear pattern where if you refine it to the ones that are, match theoretically what's happening, the effect gets bigger. You've got the quasi exp- I mean, you know, p- people should go look at this Google Doc. I mean, I don't know what else we can do to convince people that it's not just correlational. There's a lot of causal evidence. What ways could you be wrong about this evidence? Um, 
So on the experimental evidence, the published experiments, uh, my critics say that if you look at each of these studies, they're mostly pretty weak. Um, some of them have small sample sizes, just one or 200. Um, some of them, there's some other flaw. And so you can, you know, you can find, you can definitely find flaws in most of the experiments. Um, so it's possible that they're right and that only experiments that find an effect get published. Um, that is conceivable. But um, there are so many different lines of evidence here. And so I, I would ask uh, listeners to think about, we have a situation in which the parents see the problem. The parents whose kids are dead think that it wasn't, it was only because of social media that the kid, you know, that the kid committed suicide. They can, they can see the harassment taking place on, online. So you have the parents saying this is, this is causal. I don't know any parents who say, oh no, it's wonderful for my kid to be on social media. The teachers see it, the principals see it, the psychologists see it, um, the kids themselves see it. Uh, you, you had Freya India on. She is one of the best writers on what is happening to girls. Uh, and Freya published a great essay on, on my Substack. I think she referred to it on, on, on your show, uh, on the, the algorithmic conveyor belt of just, you know, once you express an interest in something, the algorithm is going to pull you all the way to eating disorders or self-harm or whatever it is. Um, so given that I can't find, I literally cannot find anything written by someone in Gen Z that says, no, we love our phones. Our phones are great. We're, our phones are, make our world better. You know, smart social media is so good for us. Like, I can't even find anyone saying that. But we have lots of people like Freya who are saying this is destroying us. So when you look at the experimental evidence that uses very limited manipulations, one very particular operationalization of the question finds a certain effect size, you got to ask yourself, which is more plausible, that everyone is wrong and all the experiments are wrong? Or maybe it's the case that something is really happening here. What is the proposed mechanism by people that say smartphones don't have this big of an impact on mental health? Because the mechanism is what's being debated. The change in mental yeah. health is pretty undeniable. We have right. very, very right. high rates of whatever. It's like the, the most cataclysmic language about girls between age 12 and 16. It's like persistent feelings of hopelessness or listlessness or something, like yeah. just the, this like awful yeah. apocalyptic language. What are the people who disagree with you saying is the mechanism that's causing this to happen? Right. They don't. They don't. That's the amazing thing. So you have, you know, you look at the graphs and they go up in very much the same way, same time in the US, the UK, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, uh, Scandinavia. We've got graphs of all this. I hope your listeners will go to afterbabble.com. That's my Substack. It's free. We've got all the graphs from all these countries. We've got the world's repository of data internationally. It all starts in the early 2010s. And so my critics say, well, the amount of variance explained is very small. So, you know, the, <clears throat> so you, <clears throat> Using social media can only explain a small amount of variance. Therefore, it can't explain the explosion, and we're done here. And then I say, well, what do you think does explain it? Mm -hmm. no, one, no one even offers. There's no alternate theory. So the global financial crisis is at least global, but that was 2008. So why is it that nothing happens to teen mental health until 2012, 2013, by which time Unemployment is dropping, stock market's rising, everything's getting better. Mm. You know, it, so it, it, the global financial crisis doesn't work. There is no other explanation that I can find, not even one that's been proposed, other than the loss of the play-based childhood to be replaced by the phone-based childhood. And that really happened between 2010 and 2015 is when the phone-based childhood came in. That explains the globalness of it. It explains the suddenness of it. It explains the gender difference. It explains everything that I found. And, you know, my critics say, well, we're not convinced, but we have, we're not even going to offer an alternative explanation. So boring, super lame. All right. What are the primary harms of technology on kids? Uh, so once you see that kids have to grow up in a physical world, we evolved outdoors, nature, animals, people. Um, when kids grow up on screens, so it's not just about social media. When you grow up with what, what I'm calling a phone-based childhood, where you're spending the latest data, I think is nine hours a day average for American kids, uh, 11 hours, Freya just said there's a British study, it was like 10 or 11 hours a day for British kids on their phones, which includes other, it includes tablets, I think, and, and video games, I think. In any case, it doesn't include homework or schoolwork, just recreational time, 
nine to 11 hours a day, that pushes out everything else. And so what I say in the book is that there are four foundational harms. Once you see that it's, it's taken up 10 hours a day, pushing everything else out, what matters? The most important thing is time with other kids, time with friends. That's crucial. I, I mean, all of your, in person, that's right, in person. Uh, and we'll talk about whether virtual is, is good, it is not. But time actually with other kids, other with your friends. And that has plummeted um, since 2012. It was dropping before in the earlier internet age, but boy, it really speeds up in the in the smartphone social media age. Um, and so kids, the, the most nutritious thing your kid can do is be out playing with other kids. And this is even true for teenagers, hanging out with no adults telling them what to do. Um, so that's crucial. That's really nutritious as it were. Now, if kids, you might say, well, but you know, they're spending of this 10, 11 hours, a lot of it is spent virtually interacting, you know, like on video games. Well, let's look at multiplayer video games. Now, those are at least synchronous. The synchronous is good. You're talking. So that's actually a good thing. The girls on social media, it's asynchronous. I comment. I wait anxiously for you to comment on my comment. And so we're not really connecting. We're actually performing and we're anxious. Um, video games are at least synchronous. But you actually, you tell me. I've ne I was never a gamer. It seems to me that you, that I'm a, you look at me. And just yeah, you think, look like That's a gamer. You're a guy tough that guy. wasted a lot of hours playing yeah. video games. Am I wrong? I wasted a lot of hours playing video games. Your okay, there correct. you go. Stereotypes sometimes have a basis in reality. <laughs> um, so, oh, look, basically, you know, you're a healthy male. That means you almost certainly were playing video games. I mean, that's just the way it's been since the '90s. Um, so, but you tell me. In video games, do you ever get in fights? Like, uh, like you get mad at each other because someone broke a rule? Of course. Oh, do, how does how does that happen? Because I assume that the game itself regulates all the interactions. How oh, you mean like cheat? fights in game? Right? No, no, no. I mean, you just you have know, disagreements. Way... You have disagreements. You shout and you say that that was that was totally stupid. Like it's more. Oh yeah, in... fine. No, but what I mean is like think about when you were, when you and your friends played a you know pickup soccer game or baseball game or whatever when you're kids and someone says no, you know it was out of bounds. No, it wasn't. Yes, it was. No, it wasn't. Okay, like yes, you yes, argue yes, about yes, it. Yes, yes, yeah. And what I'm trying to say is the arguments are really nutritious. The arguments, uh, Jean Piaget, the great developmental psychologist, really talked a lot about this. When kids play marbles, they get in all kinds of disputes, and that's crucial. They learn how to work it out. So you tell me, when, you, when you're playing video games in an average day, you know, you're four hours of video game playing, do you get in those kind of fights about, yes, it was, no, it wasn't, yes, it wasn't, it wasn't, well, or is no, everything resolved? The game, the, the, game is, the game mandates the rule set for you. Exactly. There, there, there is That's no right. mediating needed. That's right. There you go. So it's just like if I said, we're going to replace all your kids' food with rice, white rice, and then someone said, yeah, that, that should be just as good. I mean, it's got just the same number of calories. You, know, you might say, yeah, but it, it's missing all the other nutrients. And that's what we do when we put boys on video games. Yeah, it's social. It's great fun. It has some benefits. It gives them some social calories. They're talking, but it's missing a lot of the nutrients that you get from face-to-face -face interaction. Okay, face-to-face -face interaction that, that gets squeezed. That's one, and one. that's just one. I'll go faster yep. on the rest of them. Number two, sleep deprivation. Um, when kids have a screen in their room, again, these things are designed to be addictive, and when you let your kids spend hours with a device designed to be addictive sometimes they get addicted. And so the kids who have a, who have dependency, they're going to take their phone into bed with them under the covers. You know, mom can't see that the light is still on because it's under the covers. So social media in particular and browsing the internet takes away a lot of sleep. And if you take away sleep from teenagers who are already not getting enough, they're going to be crankier, less healthy. They're going to gain weight. There's all kinds of things that happen physiologically and emotionally, uh, which exacerbate the mental illness epidemics. That's two the loss of sleep. Uh, the third is attention fragmentation. One of the main things kids need to do in as teens, your brain is rewiring throughout childhood. You know, your brain is sort of pretty big by the time you're five or six. And then a lot of it's just the rewiring, the myelination of circuits. Uh, in your teen years, the frontal cortex myelinates, the, the prefrontal cortex especially, is the seat of executive control. Can you set a goal, keep your eye on the goal, do the things necessary to reach the goal, even though there are distractions. And as adults, we've all learned to do that to some degree. But crucially in that learning was those teen years when the frontal cortex is really laying down, you know, like, how do you do this? And instead, what we do is it's like we put little distractors, you know, if a lot of the kids are getting interrupted every couple of minutes for their whole life, 
they never even spend 10 minutes without an interruption. This appears to interfere with their development of executive function. So we're creating uh, young people who, when they come to the office, they can't just pay attention to something. They need more stimulation, and then they don't pay full attention. So attention fragmentation is devastating to their ability to be productive and creative. And then the fourth foundational harm is addiction. Um, you know, I get in big arguments with this with some of the researchers who are who study video games who think video games are good. Um, and they point out, you know, most boys are having a great time and there's no sign of trouble problem. Well, and that's true. That's true. Most boys who play video games, I can't say that they're damaged by it. But five or ten percent are. Um, the ones who develop problematic gaming, who are compul have compulsive use, when they're not playing, they become surly, their brain is deficient in dopamine, they are addicted, they have a, a dependency. Um, if you're going through your puberty years as a boy, getting this incredible amount of fixed stimulation, of, you know, from, you know, uh, Fortnite or, you know, whatever game you're playing, this is, uh, in addition to messing up your life, you're not, you're not spending time with friends, you're not learning how to talk to girls, whatever it is. Um, this is likely to have some very lasting, possibly permanent effect. So those are the four foundational harms. They affect boys and girls, girls on social media, not so much video games. Um, and then there's all the specific harms that affect boys and girls, we can get into those. But if, if all you knew was, here's this consumer product, it's gonna take your kid away from his friends, it's gonna deprive him of sleep, it's going to fragment his ability to focus, um, and it's going to addict him. What do you say? Do you want this for your kid? Like, who would ever say yes? But we did. Is it right to call social media use an addiction? I had this discussion with Andrew Huberman a couple of years ago, and um, I hmm. sort of... Yeah, what did he say? He said it looks to him more like a compulsion than an addiction. Mm -hmm. It feels like compulsive behavior. Um, he said, you know, if yeah. you if you saw an animal uh, scratching, scratching, scratching in the corner looking for food, scratching, 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 mm -hmm. scratching, scratch, you'd think that animal's sick. And it it feels to me, you know, I you're on a plane. How many times? It's like such a great example. You're on a plane. You have no signal. You know you have no signal. Yeah. You pull your phone you out. Checking. You open it up. Yeah. You go through the the little it's, cycle yeah. of apps or whatever uh -huh. it is that you do, and you go, ah, yeah goes back yeah. down so to me that seems compulsive now obviously yeah. addictive things can have a compulsion that's the reason i haven't got anything long and thin that i can use but that's the reason that smokers will get pens and yeah. you know chew mm -hmm. down on pens right. it actually satiates yeah. i think i saw something that's saying that uh, people who have smoking addiction can satiate a little bit of the uh, desire for their next cigarette by actually mm -hmm. putting a replacement cigarette in their mouth because yeah. so much of it is about the like uh, physiological uh, the the movement of that habituated thing yeah um so i, I and i mean the mm -hmm. semantics of what is an addiction where does that cross across into mm -hmm. a compulsion can something which is addictive lead you to have this sort of obsessive compelled behavior that where you kind of pull mm -hmm. this out it kind of doesn't really matter um but have yeah. you got have you got any uh, sure. insight on that no I, I i do you know i know that among addiction researchers there's de a debate about whether behavioral addictions are true addictions and if you look at what happens in the brain when a person is addicted to heroin or to cocaine, you know, there's, that's incredibly well studied. You know, I don't know the details. This is not my area of expertise, but that's incredibly well studied. And then I think some of them are saying when you look at behavioral addictions, it's, it's a little different. It's not quite the same. Fine. I, I can totally accept that. But to me, the question is just, let's just take gambling addiction. You know, mo most of us have been to a casino. The great majority don't have any problem, don't have any addiction. But a small number, I don't know what the percentage is. I'm guessing it's probably, you know, two to seven percent because that's what I keep finding for behavioral addictions. Um, for for some number, they uh, when they get into a zone, it's straight behaviorist psychology, stimulus response, variable ratio, reward schedules. They get into a zone and they lose track of time and they forget their troubles. And of course, their troubles are in part because they're blowing all their family's money on slot machines, but they can't stop. So um, uh, I think, would you say that a person who compulsively uses slot machines spends most of her family's money so that the family is now bankrupt and yet she still keeps doing it, would you call that a compulsion or an addiction? Both. Okay. What it, you, even if you call it, that's fine with me. If you want to call it just a compulsion, that's fine. My point is, whatever that is, for a gambling addicts, <laughs> which is real. Even word, yeah, call it whatever yeah, you want. Whatever you want to call it. That is what is happening to social media 
compulsive users, you know, whatever you want to call it, it's the same thing. And it's, I mean, in a sense, it's literally the same thing because some of the features of our life on phones were directly copied from casinos. The thing where you pull down to refresh and then it kind of bounces up and you see yeah. things like that was literally copied from slot machines. Shout out so, Tristan Harris. Yeah, he was a- uh, Yeah, that's right. Yes, Trist early, oh, yes. Tristan is a hero in all of this. Tristan early really of, brought our of attention. Telling everyone about this. Yeah, for sure. All right, yeah. so you know, there's been a lot of talk recently. I've got Daniel Cox coming on, the guy that did that really fantastic study about young boys breaking to the right and young girls breaking to the left. I've got him oh, coming yeah, on soon. Yeah. But we're seeing a lot of sexed differences in worldview, in belief, in mental health. Yeah. What mental health is, is declining, but the ways that it's declining, the sort of usages of technology. So talk to me about the sexed differences in technology. How do boys and girls use technology differently? Sure. Yeah. So the master variable here, I believe, is is a set of motivations uh, that we've talked about psychology for 50 years um, called um, agency and communion. So everybody has needs for agency, to be an agent, to make things happen. You know, a child knocks over a block tower. It's thrilling. I did that. I caused that to fall. So that's agency. And then communion is connection, being part of a group, being welcomed and embraced and, and connecting. Uh, uh, so everyone has both motives. But on average, boys have stronger agency motives. And when you let boys and girls choose what to do, the boys are going to gravitate more towards games that allow agency. And so fake war is one of the best examples. They want to practice their skills. Boys, I think, are evolutionary programmed for hunting and war, to enjoy hunting and war. I found this out when I was 29 years old and for the first time in my life played uh, paintball with my buddies. And hunting each other, we were mixed in with other, other people, but hunting each other in small groups and shooting guns to try to hit each other was the most thrilling thing we'd ever That'll done. That'll get you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that was really cool. Like, wow, there's like a room in my heart for being a hunter and a warrior. Like, I didn't really know it was there, but mm -hmm. it was. So anyway, boys choose to pursue agency motives. Girls choose to pursue more communion motives. They talk more with each other. As Richard Reeves, this you know, w wonderful, wonderful uh, British man who has this, uh, has been been making the case for boys. Have you have you had Richard on the show? Of course. Yeah, he's great. Of he's course. He's coming back on again yes. soon. Yeah. His new oh, initiative, okay. that the Center for Boys and Men. American Institute for Boys and Men. Yeah. Thank you. Uh that sounds awesome. I, I'm fully Richard Reeves pilled. I'm on board with, good. with oh, all good. the stuff yes, he's doing. Me too. Yeah. We're all Richard Reeves pilled. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um so Richard points out uh, uh girls like to do things face to face. Boys like to do things shoulder to shoulder. Like we're next to each other, but we're doing something. I've common. got it. I need to bring this up. So in, in a Robin Dunbar's book, Friends, which came out mm -hmm. maybe 18 months ago, he's got this phenomenal study. So the next time that you're at a party, look at the angle of the feet that women have when uh -oh. they talk to each other and look at the angle of the feet that really? men have. Like what? What do you mean? What do you, so what do you see? Women will talk uh, perpendicular, 180 degrees. They'll be pretty okay. much straight on like this. Oh, Men talk at about 120 degrees. Oh, that's fascinating. So they blade. Perfect. And the Perfect. reason being that this is a bit of sort of evolutionary bro psychology coming in, but I think it's true. If you if even try it, you can try it the next time that you, you're, you're at a party, just, you know, you'll be stood sort of like this with a guy mm -hmm. just blading yeah. on. And just turn yourself so that you're actually straight uh, onto them. On. And there's this just dominance rises move. up inside of you because really yeah. the only time that two guys would do that is if they were going to fight or they were yeah. going to kiss and if you don't intend on doing oh, either right. of those and, yeah. things <laughs> and you just feel you're like this yeah. feels right there's something about yeah. that angle it's like two magnet two north poles of a magnet right they yes oh good example divot away they don't want to yeah and, yeah dude look at it 120 degrees for men 180 mm. degrees for women it's and it hey. You can't not see it. Once you see it, you can't unsee it. It's oh, so good. No, I, I will look for that. And actually, that this could suggest a really cool difference between real and virtual. You know, virtual interactions are not embodied. Like you, we can see, you know, we can see each other's upper bodies here. But, but I think what we would find, because I don't at all feel freaked out by you, you know, your Being face onto on. me on my, yep. I, yeah. But I don't at all feel like, oh, we've either got to kiss or fight, like because we're virtual. <laughs> well, but, we wait until you know, we finish. Uh, yeah, yeah, you know, you are you are pretty handsome, I must say. Um, so, so again, something you know, we are embodied creatures. We're physical creatures. We're animals. We evolved outdoors. You know, we 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 had fights. We had hunts. And we we're physical creatures. And when we interact now virtually, we have only it's it, you know it's like the white rice thing. We have just like a little few of the nutrients, but we're missing most of them. 
Um, so anyway, on to boys and girls. Sorry, I'm taking too long on this, but the the point is, boy. So w- w- when when uh, you know laptops and then especially smartphones come out, all the kids love them. All the kids gravitate. All the kids are on them. The boys head straight for video games and YouTube. Um, the boys are spending more time on video games and YouTube and porn. Um, the girls go straight for the visual social media platforms, especially Instagram, uh, Tumblr, Pinterest in the early days. Uh, and so what are the effects? The girls are now on these platforms that are all about, I post a picture of me and my life, and then I wait for strangers to comment on it. And that's really, really bad for mental health. And that I think is why the girls, as soon as we hit 2012, 2013, uh, uh, the girls have very sharp elbows in the graphs, very sh- the hockey stick uh, lines in the graphs. Um, boys, on the other hand, um, they're playing video games, especially video games aren't making them depressed. Now the boys are getting more depressed and anxious. They are uh, roughly twice as depressed and anxious as they used to be, but it's more gradual. It starts a little sooner. It starts more like 2009, 2010, and, it, and it's more gradual. So I think what's happening and what you know, what Zach Rausch and I concluded in, our, in, in the book, and here we drew on Richard Reeves, is, you know, for girls, boom, they get on social media, they get depressed. For boys, they've been withdrawing from the real world since the 70s and 80s. You know, it used to be a male world, there used to be a patriarchy, I, you know, but boy, what, has it been dismantled. And as everything shifts towards girls, and as schools get more and more structured towards girls and girls' needs and girls' ways of learning, and as we all freak out about gender gaps and we think that it's the girls we have to help in the 90s which wasn't true girls had already passed boys um boys are finding that they don't do well in school they don't like school but man these video games are just getting better and better Mm. and and you know it's it's hard to approach a girl but man the pornography is getting better and better um and now you've got ai girlfriends and soon ai girlfriends will be put into incredibly sexy robots Mm. so what we're seeing is the progressive withdrawal of boys from effort in the real world that will pay off in the long run. And instead, boys' prodigious energy and their desires are being directed into a virtual world that generates nothing, absolutely nothing of any value in the real world. Yeah, the audience is going to know what I'm going to bring up, but I'm going to do it again. It's my I've only had two citations ever in academia, and this is one of them. So okay. um, you'll be aware of young male syndrome. Uh, no, tell me what, just okay. that they're, you know, young, more violent young, and... Yes, correct. Yeah. High yeah. proliferation of young sexless men, high T, high risk taking. Yeah. They yep. set shit on fire and push over granny. It's not good. Totally agree. We have the highest rates of loneliness and sexlessness amongst young men, at least in the modern world, maybe ever, uh, apart from in maybe some like crazy gerontocracy style, like tribal bullshit 10,000 right. years ago. Um, where's all of the incel violence? Like this isn't a request but why are we not seeing more mass shootings? Why are we not seeing oh, all the rest of it? Oh, that's a good point. So it's my contention oh. that men are being sedated out of their mm. status-seeking and reproductive-seeking behavior mm. through a combination of social media, video games, and porn. So they're not yep. given a sufficient dose to make them happy or satisfied, but it is enough to dampen down and nerf that, um, that impulse. So... And this is what I've called the male sedation hypothesis. And this is being studied. Uh, So why have we not got this? uh, Yeah, I'm a legitimate, Mm -hmm. illegitimate academic now. Um, But this is, (laughs) and there's a a question to be asked there, but, you know, everything that you're talking about there that it's triggering, it's playing off the back of this desire for them to um, work together as a team to have intertribal warfare, to uh, create yeah. mastery, to increase in status, right. to be able to accomplish things. Okay, yeah. but it's within the virtual world and you can become That's an right. e-gamer and so on and so forth, but how, how much can you cash out that status into the real world? Yeah. But then a more interesting question comes, which you know the game is very well made, do and say, well, if I'm enjoying it, why do I need to cash it out into the real world? Yeah. What is real and what isn't? Why, are you, why is there this sort of weird axiomatic value judgment about the fact that the real world is better than the virtual world? It's all part of a world. It's all just in dopamine, serotonin ticking around in my brain. Who cares? Same thing goes for porn. You know, I, I worried about getting me too, or I don't have the this thing or whatever, whatever, whatever. Like all of these things allow them to do that couple of white pills that me and a friend, William Costello, think with regards to the AI girlfriend virtual relationship thing. Uh, First one being dating and flirting 
is something that is incredibly anxiety inducing for men. The yes. guy that created CBT made it so that he could overcome approach anxiety. I don't know if that's Oh really? That's supposed Is this Aaron Beck or was this yeah, the other guy? Uh, the other dude. Um, uh, right. Uh, what's his name? I forget the name. Yeah. David David yeah. Buss told me about him. Uh, it was created to to help with approach anxiety. Maybe Aaron Beck was it too. I everyone's just has approach no, anxiety. I don't think so. Yeah. Um but the uh the primary challenge that you have in dating is that there is no such thing as practice dating. If me and you want to get better at pickleball, we can go mm -hmm. to the local oh, pickleball yeah. court and yeah. you can just hit drives at me and I can mm -hmm. practice my drop volley. Right. I can't. Right. It is one of the few things where you practice in public. You learn out loud. Mm -hmm. uh, so right. there's always this high pressure to, yeah. to, to not fail. And what that means is that men often have really, really they never get beyond, they never go zero to one. They never actually get that first mm -hmm. step done. Mm -hmm. So me and William think that a really phenomenal, and this, you don't even need to wait for the sex robot thing or the, whatever, the in-person robot. You could do this with Apple's VR headset if it was sufficiently well-trained mm -hmm. on a good data set. So you have a virtual interaction with a woman, like a computer game. And mm -hmm. in this virtual interaction, the avatar is able to oh, yeah. see your yeah. movements they can hear what you're saying they mm -hmm. use natural language processing to work out the intonation and and yeah. you know they're able to go back and forth and they can you know you can program in shit like consent and you can program shit in like mm -hmm. uh f flirting and 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 i want to yeah. you know, increase the yeah. difficulty the disagreeability of this girl i want her to make me work and you level up and right. level up and level up right. and if you can form that on actual human psychology you can have Guys practice playing the video game oh, in great. the safety of their own home. Yeah. And then yeah. go and deploy this in the real world. It's like, you that's know, right. tonal, one of these like at home gym things. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. It's like, yeah. you, or, or Wii Sports, right? Like, you know, you're playing a video, that's a better mm. example. You're playing Wii Sports at home, you're playing tennis or whatever. Yeah. And then you go into the real one, you're like, hey, I played a video game, but I'm kind of fitter. And this is the that's same. Right. I, I played a video yeah. game, but I'm kind of better at flirting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think uh, um, I think having practice flirting in the virtual world is actually a great idea. I think um, you're right that it. I, I remember, you know, when I was in seventh grade and the adults would organize a dance, it was terrifying. You know, and occasionally I would ask a girl to dance, and either she'd say yes or no, but it was terrifying. But again, that's that like fear and thrill when she does occasionally say yes. Um, I I agree that in theory we could do that, that the headsets, that the virtual reality, you really could give boys practice flirting with realistic girls and the difficulty level could get harder and harder. Now, how would this actually play out in the real world? Um, I fear that it's not really going to be, hey, let's try to make you into the best possible romantic partner, likely to find a really wonderful woman and they get happily married. I fear that it's going to turn into either here's you know, the game is to get the woman in bed and then move on to the next woman. And here, it, you know, it will learn, teach you how to, how to bed women. Mm. Um, or it's going to be design the woman you want. And you're going to, you know, let's make her even lovelier. Let's give her an even better sense of humor. How about if she never gets mad at me? Mm -hmm. You know, you program in all these things that are just going to take you in an unrealistic way. So well, you we see over and over you've, again. You've, you've got an evolutionary background. I have yes. to say, I, I want to bring you back. And once this tour is done, I want to bring you back on. And if you can remember it to talk about the happiness hypothesis, because it it was one of the three books that got me into the world of EP and and and, and really sort of made me fall in love with it. But we, given that background, again, me and William have spoken about this an awful lot. We talked about this AI girlfriend revolution. One of the problems that you have, and one of the reasons that I don't think we need to fear the AI girlfriend thing quite as much is no guy brags about the fact that he is subscribed to some woman's only fans. The reason that you don't brag about it is that there is no status associated with being right. selected. There is yeah, no- it makes you look like a loser. And yeah. But not only that, that even if it didn't, even if it was neutral in the like loser- Oh, I see. Uh, uh -huh. Metrics, because yeah. you haven't been pre-selected by the, 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 the gatekeeper is right. the price of a cheeseburger per month. Yeah. Therefore- yeah. Anyone has access to this, and because of the access, it's you know, maybe if you have a thirty thousand dollar sex robot, it's a flex of your wealth, but it's also like, mm -hmm. dude, you no. spent thirty thousand dollars on a sex robot. How weird are you? So, and I just, yeah. I, I don't, I don't know what's going to happen, but I certainly know that that pre-selection, the status associated with a woman who is the gatekeeper mm -hmm. choosing a man who is the protagonist, yeah. that accounts for so much of the okay. bragging rights of the guy yes 
Great. So this brings in a key ta- a keyword we haven't mentioned is status. And boys are boys and girls are each competing for status, but uh, boys' competition is really much more. It's about ultimately about like physical toughness, dominance, originally in sort of the primeval state, ultimately backed up by the ability to physically beat the shit out of somebody. Um, but in modern times, that gets converted into other other ways of contesting. And we've had a long, slow evolution of our economy, uh, such that such that it, we've harnessed male ambition for status and turned it in productive directions. In fact, I was going to write a book. I got a contract to write a book called Three Stories About Capitalism, The Moral Psychology of Economic Life. I was going to write a book on like the psychology of capitalism. Mm. And then the universities melted down and I wrote the coddling and I got drawn off into all these other, other things. But one of the key insights um, is there's a, uh, um, is, you know, Adam Smith realized that when you get an economy set up the right way, it's not from the benevolence of the butcher and the baker and the brewer that we expect our dinner, but from their regard for their own self-interest. When people can get money for doing something that helps others, well, then men try very hard to make money. But it's not just money. When you can get status by doing something productive, that's going to challenge. Like men are like rockets. Like they have this, they have this incredible capacity for work, but they're often misaimed. And so yeah, I think it's quite remarkable that, you know, when, you know, Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos want to face off, how do they do it? Who can build the more effective rocket launch system into outer space? I mean, that's a great way for men to compete. So that's productive. Um, and uh, I think what you're saying, what you're pointing out is part of dating. I mean, part of it is very intrinsically motivated. You want a girlfriend, you want sex, you want love, but you also, yeah, you want a hot girlfriend. You want someone that other guys will respect you for because yeah, I got this woman. So any discussion of boys, yes, we must consider status, especially what are other men going to think of me? And also what are other women going to think of me based on who I date? Um, women are extremely concerned with what other women will think of them as, as well, separate status competitions. But yeah, that's a key. And video games give them an alternate world in which they can gain status within that alternate world. But I keep coming back to the metaphor of the black hole. You know, black hole is a place where anything gets sucked in, but nothing comes out. And so, okay, here, here's another controversial idea. I'll air it with you. Maybe you can, <laughs> you can uh, disprove it. Um, here, I'll just put this as a contention. I don't know if this is true. My contention is that nobody or is that hardly anyone in Gen Z has, re- has done anything yet that has really made an impact on the world. Let me just qualify. There are always going to be athletes, always. There are always going to be singers coming along. That's not the issue. The issue is, did you start a company? Did you make some discovery? Did you write an amazing book? Did you do something that the world notices and says like, oh, wow, you know, that's impressive. And when I ask this of audiences, they only come up with two names. Uh, and so I'll ask you, who are the members of Gen Z who've really, you know, dented the universe? They've really done something. When who does Gen they? Z start and finish? The Gen Z is now 28 years old. So everybody who's 28 years old or younger, God it starts in 19, birth it. year 1996. I'm one, I'm one year old. I was going to say Boyan Slat, the guy that founded and was the CEO of the Ocean Cleanup, you know, that huge... A thing that cleans plastic out of oh, the ocean, okay. uh, but right, that would count. Yeah, he's twenty nine. He's twenty nine, so we yeah. missed him. He's, he's a millennial. In my, he's, so he's in the my millennials group. are creative and productive and mentally healthy, but Gen Z. So wait, try again. You, you, I'm sure you're going to come up with the one name that everyone comes up with. What's one person under twenty nine who really has changed the world? Greta Thunberg. That's it. That's the one everyone comes up with. And then there's a second that people sometimes come up with. Malala. Who? Malala, uh, the woman Pakistan, uh, from Pakistan, she was shot by, you know, fundamentalists, but she survived and she's a, you know, a, a, Don't think a, a rights activist. I was never okay. going to get that. Okay. Anyway, so Greta, Greta is the one that everyone comes up with. Um, but that's it. So there are no Americans. Um, there are no men. Um, and I started thinking this two or three years ago and I keep waiting. Someone's going to find me a, a Gen Z person who's really done something big. Now, a lot of them want to start their own business as an influencer, they want to create an app. So it's, I'm, I'm not saying they're not lazy. What I'm trying to say here is as far as I can tell, they have been raised in an economy where what you're desperately trying to do is get more followers, get more influence, and it's all quantified. And as long as you're working hard at that, you're not generating anything that will leave the black hole of social media, nothing that will affect the world outside of your closed world well, of I mean, people about, seeking status. I'm sure that you're aware of it, but the percentage of primary school kids that say that they want to grow up to be a YouTuber or an influencer. 
That's so, exactly. you, you know, you That's have right. the, they're being fed in on the front end with this presupposition, and then they're being spat out on the back end too with this yep. lack of impact in the real world. Yeah, well, I mean, exactly. you know, maybe this is one of the white pills of uh, automation and AI and leverage. Wait, what's a white pill? I haven't heard that term. Uh, what does that mean? So a, bl a black pill is... Uh, something that's nihilistic and it's an insight that makes you feel kind of mm. uh, apocalyptic and, and, and uh, oh. uh, fatalistic. And a white pill would be a reason for hope. It's a justification for hope. Oh, nice. Yeah. Okay, I've got to start developing a few so, of those because my talks can get kind of dark. So, all right, white pills, go ahead. Yeah, just talking about a white pill. So a white pill from, yeah. you know, and it's particularly useful to use in contrast to something that people see as something that's bad. Uh, AI is going to come, mm. it's going to take all our jobs and everyone's going to be, it's going to be the matrix. But right. one of the advantages is that if we're in this current lull of real world inventor, invention from Gen Z, maybe, um, mm -hmm. the increase in leverage that we have through code means that a smaller number of people can have a larger amount of impact. So the few that break through from Gen Z and do do great things can maximize and magnify their impact on the world in a way that might be able to compensate for the rest okay. of their generation's lack. Okay, that that's a good point. I agree that that's possible. Um, but this just sort of slots right into one of my main concerns about what's happening, which is that digital technology and now artificial intelligence is likely to usher in an era of material prosperity. If we all have an infinite number of servants to help us make whatever we want, yes, there's going to be a rise of productivity. And all these people who point to the coming golden age, they're looking at material prosperity, they're looking at physical health, discoveries will, will cure cancer. Yeah, materially, things are going to get better, as they have been continuously. Um, you know, Matt Ridley pointed this out, Steve Pinker pointed this out. But I'm a social psychologist, and I play sociologist in my spare time, because I think what we're heading into is a sociological apocalypse. That is, all the things it takes to make a stable society, they're not visible. Uh, I learned this from Emil Durkheim and from reading conservative writings. Um, institutions, structures, traditions, all the things that make our society possible, but many people don't see. And these are being rotted out. And this precedes this precedes the internet. I mean, there, you know, there's always, you know, there's the thing, uh, hard times create strong men, strong men create good times, good times create weak men, weak men create hard times. So, you know, there's been kind of a decline since the World War II was a huge stimulus for all kinds of amazing after effects. Um, and there's a decline since then. So it's not all caused by, by the recent technologies, but I think it's been accelerated by it. And so what you're pointing to is yes, more material prosperity. And yeah, that's true. But if we have collapsing institutions, no trust in anything, um, and we're willing to consign a generation to just wasting their time struggling for status on, you know, on TikTok, because as long as 12 of them are creative and create gigantic new things <laughs> we'll be just as, as good off as we were you know 10 years ago yeah so yeah I'm, okay maybe less of a white that's a gray about, pill that's a gray pill perhaps. Uh, yeah oh good uh, you know what gray pill that because it's both it's black yes. and white i like it okay or, um, a zebra pill a zebra yeah, pill perhaps it's yeah it's striped it's striped okay so we've spoken about boys and what's happening with them you know there's so much conversation around young teen girl mental health give me the latest data what are you seeing what's happening with with the young girls sure so, I mean, Freya covered covered this beautifully, and, and she writes about this beautifully on her Substack Girls. Um, but sort of the, you know, the, the big picture here is, let's start with the mental health, but there's a lot more going on. Uh, with the mental health, it's very specific for girls. It's what's, what are called internalizing disorders. It's especially depression and anxiety. Um, you know, other things are up, but like, you know, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, they're all up a little bit, but it's really depression and anxiety. Um, uh, girls have what are suffer more from what are called internalizing disorders. So if there's stresses and problems, they kind of turn it inwards and they suffer anxiety, depression. Boys historically um, suffer more from what are called externalizing disorders. When there are problems with their development, they act out. They make other people miserable. Crime, you know, deviance, violence. Um, so so that's historically the way girls and boys were. But what's happened is actually both girls and boys have moved more in the direction of internalizing disorders, but girls especially. So the numbers are hard to believe, but they're up around 30 or 40% of girls, uh, teenage girls, would qualify as having depression or anxiety disorders. Um, it used to be more like 10 or 15%. So 
Uh, it's now a normal thing to be an American or British teenage girl. It's just a normal thing that you think about suicide and you have your anxiety and you manage your anxiety. It's part of your identity. It's part of, uh, it's, it's, it's with you all the time. So it's tragic. It's, it's so sad, you know? Um, it used to be the case that middle-aged people were the least happy. It's a well-known thing called the U-shaped curve of happiness. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The happiest people used to be young adults, you know, teenagers and young adults, and then people in their 60s and 70s. They're done with the hard work, they get to enjoy their lives. But there's always people in the middle, you know, taking care of kids and parents. That's not true anymore. In Western countries, the young people have plunged, and especially the girls. So we have a graph in the book, Canadian data, uh, Canadian young Canadian women used to be the happiest. Now they're by far the least happy uh, group of people in Canada. So uh, for girls, the mental health, the anxiety, depression, that's like the central finding. But there's a lot more. Um, oh, your, your, your question about that? Go on, go on, go yeah. on. Okay. Um, so, you know, so much of the debate is just about the mental health data. But there's so much else that's warping girls' development and making them less happy. Um, the the hypersexualization, the pornification of everything, the fact that you've got these young girls on Instagram aping these millennial women with gigantic boobs and butts and fillers and all kinds of things, this just this is just really really bad for them. So even if they don't get depressed and anxious, and they do, but even if they didn't, the fact that they oh my god, the number of girls now middle school girls who are using skincare products and who are concerned about their skin um, and, you know, and doing makeup tutorials, you know, like, no, your skin is perfect. Go have fun. You know, yes, you, you, you care about how you look. Girls have always cared about how they look. That's part of life. It's part of, for boys too. But to take, to take these, you know, wonderful, sprightly, funny, you know, fifth, sixth grade girls, and then suddenly to have them focus so much on, on their face and their beauty because they're on social media is a tragic loss of girlhood. There's that. There's the exposure to older men, uh, creepy men who want to watch them dance, who want to talk with them. There's the the whole economy of nudes from the boys in their class. If the boys will send them a dick pic and then say, "Come on, send me one of yours. Come on, come on. Yeah, don't be a prude. Don't be a prude." Um, and if a and then if a girl does send anything, now the boys really got something valuable. And we cite, uh, you know, there's a, a, a book, American Girls, you know, she, uh, the author documents how middle school boys will get a, a nude photo of a girl, and then they can give it, they can trade it to high school boys for beer. And so the girl's nakedness, the girl's humiliation is valuable to the boy because he can get alcohol and prestige by giving it to an older boy who can buy him beer or get him beer somehow or other. So, you know, the commodification, the hypersexualization, the humiliation of girls once they enter the world of social media, you know, it's just, I mean, it's just on so many fronts that phone-based childhood is not a human childhood and kids are stuck in it. You have an evolutionary background. You titled the book, The Anxious Generation. Of all of the litany of different human emotions that we have, Anxiety is the one that's very prevalent, which are hearing about anxiety disorders and things that are downstream from it. There's even a disorder now where people can't distinguish between anxiety and depression. Uh, and it, it means that then, I, what the fuck? I literally learned it yesterday from David Brooks. God damn it. Anyway, it, it, they, they struggle to work out the difference between anxiety and, and depression. So it's bleeding into... Wow. Um, First off, from an evolutionary perspective, I think it's a bit of a cope by people for, with my intellectual interest background of EP to say, well, well, you know, we're built to be vigilant. You know, we've got the smoke detector yep. principle. We're blah, blah, blah. I'm like, yeah. But it's really tuned up now. It's yeah, not just right. tuned up. It's like uh, yeah. supercharged. And okay, mm -hmm. my, my, right. my question being, why anxiety? What is it about the soup, the cocktail of stimulus that we have at the moment mm -hmm. that's causing anxiety to be the predominant yeah. outcome? Yeah. So I think it's two, there are many contributing factors, but two big ones. 
One is the loss of thrilling play in childhood, which we talked about. If kids don't get to take risks, they don't learn to manage risks, and then any little thing seems threatening. This is why students were suddenly asking for trigger warnings in part, because the idea that a book that describes a Greek myth in which Zeus rapes a woman, can we expect young women to just have to read this? Like, so what is just exposure? If kids don't have exposure when they're young and they don't have thrills and they don't have risk, then any little thing is going to be much harder for them when they're older. That's one piece. The other is growing up on the stage. Um, you know, when you're growing up, you make a lot of mistakes. You say something stupid to your friend and then your friend might criticize you. Your friend might even get angry at you and then you make up. But when that happens on the stage, you say something and before you know it, everyone is talking about it and they're adding on their own comments and you're the butt of the joke. And as anyone ever knows who's been through any kind of a cancellation attempt or any kind of public uh, online thing, it's painful in a way beyond anything that we know in, in, in terms of physical suffering. Uh, it, it really makes people want to disappear, and it is a spur to suicide. So when the entire school is laughing at you, you know, or the you know the photo you sent of your of your genitals, or the thing you said that somebody caught and then added a con you know, so kids should not grow up on a stage. The British, I'm told, have a saying: "Don't put your daughter on the stage, Mrs. Worthington." Is this something you've ever heard? No. Okay, older British people. I believe it's a Noel Coward song from like 100 years ago. But uh, don't put your daughter on the stage, Mrs. Worthington, um, is good advice, especially for girls. And girls are much more anxious than boys. So if a girl grows up, everything she says can be amplified. Every image of her is commented on. She never develops just the basic security to move from minute to minute and hour to hour and person to person. Like Because anything could blow up at any time. People are always judging you. So we have to give kids a normal human childhood if we expect them to develop normal human strengths. What can we do? Ah, good, because I was just noticing we are, our time is running out. Let's turn to the solutions. And here's my white pill. Um, if we were talking about democracy and American democracy, I, I'd be all black pill. Like, I think we're, you know, I, I don't know how we get out of this in American democracy. But when we're talking about the teen mental health crisis, we can get out of it in a year or two. Uh, and they've already started in Britain. Uh, and here's what you do. Um, because it's all a series of collective action problems. The reason why fifth graders now are getting smartphones is because all the other fifth graders are getting them. The reason why my students can't quit Instagram and TikTok, even though they know it's wasting their time and making them anxious, is because everyone else is on it. So they have to be on it. So it's a these are all collective action problems. And the way you deal with a collective action problem is with collective action. So if we just have four clear norms, four norms, we can solve this. First norm, no smartphone till high school. If you want to age, send your kid out. high school? Uh, uh, in America, it's around age 14. So in Britain, the movement is 14 because I think you don't have quite the exact cutoff. Right. We have a very clear, almost all schools, it's like, you know, eighth grade is still middle school, early puberty, but then ninth, 10th, 11th, 12th is high school, roughly age 15 to 18. Um, or, you know, 14, 15 to 18. So if, if we just delay smartphones till high school, Give them a flip phone. Let them communicate with each other and with you as the parents. But to give them the internet in their pockets so that when they're on the bus, they're not talking with other kids, they're flipping through stuff. At lunch, they're flipping through stuff. Um, so no smartphone till high school at the earliest. Two, no social media till 16. This one is going to be a little harder to uh, get as a norm. But you know, if most of us parents would say, like, no, you're not getting until 16, they can't say, but I'm the only one. I'm excluded. They have to say, you know, half the kids have it, but half don't. And then you say, well, you know, you're going to be in the half that don't. And before you know it, it'll be a lot more than half that don't. Uh, the third norm, phone-free schools. This is a must. And this one we can do this year, this year, like this September. Um, the teachers hate the phones. The principals hate the phones. I ask them, why don't you ban them? Why don't you have the kids lock them up? And they say, because some of the parents will freak out. They demand to be able to contact their kid anytime during class, text them, anything. But most parents are now beginning to see this is messing up our kids. So I'm urging, if, if you're listening to this, if you have kids in school and the school allows kids to have phones on them, please contact the principal of your kid's school and say, please go phone free. It's, it's messing up their education. It's making them lonely. There's no good that comes from kids having phones in schools. Same thing with access to anything that can text. That's the third norm. The fourth norm is more independence, 
replay and responsibility in the real world. Because you can't just take away the phones and the screens or you know, reduce it. You can't just like reduce it 80%, let's say, and then say, now sit in your room and look at the wall or you know, learn how to knit or something. What kids really want, I once read, a, a long ago, I read a book on like the secret life of dogs. Like what do dogs really want? The answer is each other. Like they, they're pack animals. They really want to be with other dogs. And the same is true for kids. Um, what do they really want? To hang out with other kids. And so doing that on a video game isn't nearly as satisfying, but try to arrange it so that your kids can really spend a lot of time with other kids unsupervised, no adult telling them what to do, no adult resolving the conflicts. Um, so if we do those four things, no smartphone till high school, no social media till 16, phone-free schools, more independence, responsibility, and free play in the real world, do those four things, we will roll back the phone-based childhood. This childhood only really came in around 2012. We've only had it in about 12 years. It wasn't like this in 2008, 2009. Um, so it's not permanent. You know, we, we can change it and we have to change it uh, because it is devastating our kids. There's no other explanation for the multinational mental health crisis. And with four norms of collective action, we can act collectively to reverse it. How's that for a white pill? I like it. I, and I also love the fact that you've inculcated this new lexicon is just is swimming through you. It owns you now and it's staring out through <laughs> your eyes. Um, That's what happens when you write a book. I'm going to guess that there'll be a lot of uh, parents listening who have got kids that are maybe going to be getting to that age that probably kids get phones now, maybe like eight, nine, something like that, yeah. maybe even earlier, mm -hmm. I suppose. Um, yeah. They get their own iPad. Yeah. You can't do, we, we don't have a God's eye view and we can't coordinate perfectly. Mm -hmm. Would a small scale solution be something like try and speak to your child's friend's parents and Bingo. say, Bingo. Hey, yep. Let's you do a it. cartel. Let's have this. I've, yep. I've listened to this phenomenal episode with this great psychologist and this very handsome British dude. And they said <laughs> that we really need to do yeah. this. Why don't we, hey, do you have a watch or read the book, Anxious mm -hmm. Generation? Can, can we get together? We can't do this nationally, but can we do this locally? Presumably that's a good first step. Absolutely. That's right. That's exactly the thing to do. Um, and there are a number of organizations, almost all started by moms, um, who are helping. So for in the UK, um, I've only recently learned about delaysmartphones.org.uk and smartphonefreechildhood.co.uk. So those are two organizations that are trying to help parents do exactly that. Now, of course, if you simply know that you're in touch with the parents of your kid's best friends, which usually you are, you can just text them, you can just call them, you can just talk to them at, at school pickup or whatever. So yes, coordinating on a small scale will really, really make it easy for you and your those other families to give your kids back a play-based childhood. The goal isn't just to delay the phones, the goal is to give them a play-based childhood. If the school can help and say, we're going phone free, and if the principal could say, and parents, given the latest research, you know, I urge you to consider delaying, you know, try to at least wait till high school. If the school could give some guidance, that really helps set the norm. Mm. So this is why I'm so optimistic, because the revolution began in the UK last month. Literally, I mean, there was an article in The Guardian, you know, the, these, these two women, the, the women who run Smartphone Free Childhood, um, they you know, had a WhatsApp group, there was a little publicity, you know, huge numbers of parents, like everyone... The parents hate this stuff. The parents are ready to act. And in Britain, they are rising up and taking matters into their own hands. And my hope is that uh, is that we're ready to pop in the United States, that in, in March and April of 2024, everyone will really understand, like, you know, we know something's wrong here. Let, let, let's try to really put our finger on it. And then what do we do? What we do is enact these four norms. Hell yeah. Jonathan Haidt, ladies and gentlemen. Jonathan, I love your work. I've been a fan of it for a very long time. It's great to finally have you on the show. You're officially a Modern Wisdom alumni now. Uh, where should people go? They want to keep up to date with all your writing. And you did a really uh, interesting writing process for this where it was sort of very transparent in, in, in a way yeah. that, that is pretty in, uh, yeah. typical. Yeah, I started a Substack. Um, I thought I would never do that because I don't have time to write. But I started a Substack at afterbabble.com. And Zach Rausch and I, we put out all our findings, all our research, all our graphs, invited comment, invited criticism. Um, and now we're bringing in voices like Freya Indias and, and Ricky Schlott. Um, uh, we're bringing in you know, Gen Z. So just please go to afterbabble.com, sign up, subscribe to the Substack. Uh, the website for the book is anxiousgeneration.com. And of course, I hope you'll buy the book itself. Uh, Anxious Generation, um, you know, sold wherever books are sold. Hell yeah. Jonathan, I really appreciate you. Thank you for today. 
Chris, what fun. Thank you very much for tuning in. If you enjoyed that episode, there is something else you will absolutely love right here. Go on, give it a tap. <laughs>